It's Tuesday, November 12th, 2013. I'm Rim, and this is Geek Nights. Tonight, Games of the Yard. Let's do this. So yeah, I finally got Google Glass. It's uh, Join the club. It is exactly what I expected, because unlike... A lot of people out there, I had perfectly reasonable expectations based on my own research. Okay. <laughs> I knew what it would be like. It's about what I expected. And the only interesting thing I can really say about it is that I'm finding, I, I don't know, I feel like I got used to it really quickly. And as a result, whenever I'm not wearing it, I periodically already kind of every now and then look up and then nothing happens. Well, I, uh <laughs> Well, I mean, for you, right, you're already a glasses That's wearer. That's the thing. I already wear glasses, so wearing Google Glass has no physical disruption on my life. Wearing them and not wearing them is the same, so I don't notice a physical presence. So I don't, unless I think or pay attention, I won't really know if I'm wearing glass or not. I just kind of always assume that screen is there, and then occasionally it's not there because I'm not wearing the glass. I'm wearing my other glasses. Mm-hmm. But um, I did a lot of research, and while I can get the prescription semi-maybe or maybe not official uh, setup sometime next year, I ain't waiting. So I found an optician who is willing to make me custom prescription lenses that will clip in the same way that... I'm so rich. Look at me. I'm so rich. So here's the deal. President Money Money. You know, Scott and I were talking about this. (laughs) All the things that aren't made by Google that are related to glass seem to be things that are aimed at people with a lot of disposable income. <laughs> Perhaps due to the overlap of demographics. Well, I mean, when you have a luxury item, the accessories market for it is going to be other luxury targeted things, right? It's like if you're selling Ferrari accessories, you're not selling cup holders, <laughs> okay? Right? So for glass, it's the same thing. Because glass is a high-ticket luxury item, all the accessories and apps for it are also high-ticket targeted but, towards so here's the thing custom lenses things. are several hundred dollars anyway at minimum mm-hmm. so getting custom lenses with a custom mount bespoke lenses you know well you know as an aside i used the word bespoke at work in reference to some i, I was making a joke and i was always say here's an artisanal character sheet mm-hmm. i was like here's a bespoke alert rule template for one of our products what about a, a- uh, is so, it haute couture? How do you pronounce that? So every <laughs> everyone involved in this conversation, with one exception, was like, bespoke? <laughs> what? <laughs> but then the one person who knew that term... Was laughed. He, he laughed and then explained it to everybody. <laughs> and then he was like, I really only hear it used in, in uh, reference to designer custom clothing, mm-hmm. not other things. But then he pointed something out interesting, that... He's noticed that tech people have been using the term a lot in reference to technology over the last few years. Mm -hmm. And that's a recent trend in his mind, in his uh, experience. And I will admit that my first encounter with that word was Agloff. My first encounter with that word was some hipster place. And then, yeah. For me, it was bespoke fucks. No, right. Yeah. I, I knew what the word meant when I read that comment. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was able to assume from context what the word meant. So a hint to all you kids out there, especially you younger kids. You know how to read? Yeah. You really? Can, you can... You are you are literate? I, I don't know. I've, I've run into a problem lately in my interactions with younger listeners. They're li- young. They're not literate. But the, uh, you can figure out the gist of what a word means from not context, Not if you're guys. not literate. Guys... Guys, it's not that hard. If you're illiterate, then you can't. That's I mean, maybe if I say that my foo things. has too much spleen, then maybe maybe there's some trouble with that context. But yeah, I like Google Glass. Uh, I rigged up a sort of custom prescription lens in the meantime that it, it works fine, except it looks like the kind of glasses that an unfashionable dad from the early 80s would wear. Mm. Like, these insert, these lenses are not designed for humans to see. They're, they're supposed to be inside of my ski goggles. They're not for humans to see. They're for dolphins. Do- why would a dolphin see them skiing goggles? Dude, imagine if you're a fucking nearsighted dolphin. You think, like, oh, man, that shark is way far away. I'm, ch- I'm cool. Or you know, maybe uh, that's the ones that are get caught in all the nets of the fishermen. Maybe that, but nearsightedness doesn't mean things look further away than they are. Uh, in fact, things are more. It, oh, it means you in. can't see shit that's far away. Yes, it means the further away you're, you're. Oh, I'm safe here. There's no sharks around. It oh, means nom, your nom. focal point is actually close. 
So you can focus on things that are so very, very close. So you can see Google close. Glass itself. You just can't see the So book here's how bad my vision is. Also, because of the way they project the glass image. Because the, it's interesting. The first thing everyone asked me was not the dumb questions you get, but the question was always the same question. So where is the screen? Who's asking you this? People on the street or people that you already uh, knew? One person in the subway. No uh, one ever asked me that question ever. One person who I was playing Ingress, and then the guy was also playing Ingress, and he was like, yo, dog, got Google Glass? Where's the screen? That like, show, give, where's the screen show up? That should give you some, um, um, I don't know. It's hard. <laughs> what do you mean? Where, that's it's right there. I put my that's hand That's also like, sort of a dumb question because it's like, well, you, it where else? Like, can, it's on my left. Where but how no, far away? Nothing. Like, does it look like it? Like, people don't know. Like, most people still think it's a heads-up display, and Google has not disavowed normal people of that notion. Yeah, it's like you have a little rectangle TV in the corner. Yep, it's about, like, a hand... Like, put your hand out as far as your arm will reach in front of you, and then twist your palm so your palm is facing you. It's about there and yeah. about that big. It's like there's a see-through TV just sort of floating around. Yep. In the top right corner. But if I don't have the prescription glass in... I can't see the Google Glass screen. It's out of focus. If I ever had to compete at you with anything and the stakes are not low as they usually are... You're going to knock my glasses I'm off. I'm definitely going to knock on that. Yeah, you know what? If I'm ever competing you in, with you in something where the stakes <laughs> are sufficiently not low, Going one, for I'm the kicking groin? you in the balls. <laughs> yeah, that's my second and two, move. two... Because you won't see it coming. Two, I'm not wearing Google Glass. I'm wearing, <laughs> like, my ski goggles. <laughs> <laughs> if we're having some sort of Lock Lamora contest, then all bets are off. Uh, stabbing, I guess. I'll have to, you don't have any stab armor. Uh, I could. I just saw an ad randomly for a stab and bulletproof suit. Um, bespoke. Maybe I'll do the, <laughs> who is the guy from Australia? Kelly? Ned Kelly. Ned Kelly, that's my new strategy. Ned Kelly, a.k.a. the world's first weeaboo. <laughs> Armor plus guns, can't lose. <laughs> well, did lose. <laughs> Six dudes. <laughs> so the only other thing I'll say about Glass now, and we'll talk about it later once, you know, I write apps and play with it, and we've talked about it before, is this. It is worth the price of admission as is if they never add anything to it just for... The turn-by-turn, GPS-enabled bike navigation. But I don't have that. Yeah, I cannot. Like, I expected it to be okay. So what I did, the first thing I did, I took glass. I walked out of Chelsea Market after I was all done in there. I got on a city bike, and I said, Google Glass, navigate, whatever. And I told it to navigate me somewhere specific and far away in a neighborhood I didn't know. And then I just biked there. And the directions were so perfect and so easy to use. I cannot express to you how much I love having that there. And I can't wait to drive with those navigations in my eye. Mm. And then the battery runs out in the middle of the drive. Yeah, so I already experimented with that. The Using the navigation does not seem to diminish the battery life at all. Well, that's because the phone is doing most of the work. Yes, and... And the your screen, phone battery dies already driving, so... So the phone, the, the screen only turns on when a turn's coming yeah, up? Yeah, I know, I have it. Yeah. But you haven't used the navigation. Uh, no, but I know that the screen all turns on hardly ever. Yeah, but the screen turns on every time there's a turn coming up or there's anything weird coming up. And it also plays a little tone and tells you through that awesome transducer speaker that works perfectly. <laughs> mine doesn't work perfectly. I know, mine does. I don't know if there's Maybe a difference. Maybe they upgraded it. Mine basically, if it, it beeps, and if someone calls me on the phone, it tries to use it to be like for the phone call. But then it just sounds like... <sighs> well, see, I got the cool little uh, earbud you can stick in now. They're going to make stereo earbuds, which yeah, they are. is going to be good because then it's like, oh, I finally have Bluetooth headphones. Okay. I always wanted those. No wires. Yep. But yeah, we'll see. I like Google Glass a lot, and I'm going to try to write an app for it at some point in the next month. You will not succeed. The Mirror API is so easy to use. That's the web API. You can't really do much with it. That's I know. I'm use. not going to try to write anything real yet because I don't want to go down the road of Android development. Mm -hmm. I'm going to use the Mirror API and make something dumb and useful and assume that I'll have internet when I would use that thing. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. That's, uh, that's it. That's it. Get on to some news. Yeah, but my computer just all messed up. Like what? Anyway. What, what's, what'd you do? So it is Tuesday. I guess Explorer crashed or some shit. Anyway, I know what my news is. So uh, it's gaming day. It's Tuesday. Maybe we should actually talk about that. All right, game time. Right. Um, one of the games that we don't really like is Pandemic. Uh, in fact, we have lectured in multiple unrelated lectures in a section about how much we hate Pandemic and how we think it's a bad game from... 
almost every bad perspective. Game. So they're coming out with Pandemic the Dice Game. And this seems to be happening a lot lately where you have a game and then they come out with like the same game again. So like Tigris and Euphrates, the card game. Or uh, what are the, there's a lot of them that have card game San versions. San Juan. Right. There's, there's like you have a big game and you make some other version of it. So they make pan- they're coming out, I think, next year with Pandemic. There was, the, there was the Dice Monopoly that came out way back in the day. Right. They're coming out with Pandemic the Dice Game. And I predict it's going to be bad. I read the description of it, and basically it sounds nearly identical to Pandemic. So every problem that Pandemic has, this game also has. The only difference is All right. that from what I can tell based on a description and not reading the rule books, this isn't final. Well, but, I'm basing my opinion based on literally nothing, so go on. Right. Is that it's identical to Pandemic, but instead of that deck that reveals like where shit appears, right, you roll dice. And each player, right, the different roles, has different dice. And on your turn, you roll your dice, and whatever they come up, those are the actions that you can take. Instead of being able to take, you know, any combinations of actions, you're more limited by luck, right? Because you roll these dice. I assume you can Yahtzee the dice. I don't know. It didn't didn't have Anyone who makes a dice game where you can't Yahtzee the dice, fucked up, guys. Who knows? But it's the point is, is that it's a... You know, it's uh, it, otherwise it seems clearly identical to Pandemic based on the rules that were described. Uh, I was burned by the a lot of like I remember specifically so why, the so Tigris it, and Euphrates card game. Just it shared these superficial similarities, but was just kind of bad. Right. So the reason this is weird to me is because usually when they make these you know other versions of games like something something the card game or something something the dice game, right? That new version of it bears some mechanical similarity but is usually highly simplified and shortened and more portable and has these other features that you know it's like yeah you can't bust out t and e right now but you can bust out this card game right this seems like it's not less than pandemic it doesn't seem to take less time or play faster at least based on the description so why, it's like they're just trying to, it's like, why would you play this instead Well, of you know what it does do? It removes the need for a big board and abstracts it completely. Sure. You just have a little circle disc, it looks like, for each continent. And mm-hmm. then you put dice that you expended or used or whatever on those continents. Yep. And there's a little circle track that looks like a cribbage bridge score track. Yep. Yeah, I'm gonna assume this is bad. Also, the pic- the the dice look like they. It have doesn't seem stickers. like it actually solves any of the problems of pandemic, right? If you're trying, uh, I would argue that for the people who like pandemic and for the people who make pandemic, none of those things are problems because they like the game. I really wish there was some data collection on board game playing because I get the feeling, right? You look at something like pandemic. And it's hugely popular. It sells really well. Like right? I go to a convention, and like and there are a fourth at the tables are playing some variant of Munchkin? pandemic <laughs> or Munchkin, Munchkin at some given right. time. There are people clearly they exist who are into it, right? Like they are, you know, they are playing a lot of Munchkin or they are playing uh, a whole lot of pandemic, and that's their thing, and they're into it. But I get the feeling that maybe. A lot of people, like, they play it a few times and they're way into it. Some sort of churn. Right. And then they're not into it, but maybe they'll play a few games sometime later, right? But they're into it, then they're not into it. And then another wave, and it's like a wave that passes over the community. And at any time, at any given moment, the hump of the wave is large, which is why the game is popular because, you know, it can, it can, it spreads almost like a, you know, a fractal kind of However, thing. However, like that a, hump is big like enough. Like a that pebble falling into the water. It spreads. The hump is big enough that it would imply a but large, the middle constant of the, ingress of people getting into board games. Well, you know, even if it's not people getting into board gaming, it's you play the game and then you play the game with new friends and then you play the game with, right? Uh, and, and I think that's what, if you think about it, if you think about a, a circle, right, the radius keeps increasing, but the only players are the people who are around the edge of the circle, and the middle of the circle isn't really playing the game very much at all. So I wonder. That's uh, what I think it might be. I think there's, uh, there's a two-step going on. I think you're right. I never considered that angle. Mm-hmm. So I think there is a huge churn through games like Pandemic. But two, I think there's, a sm- there's one other factor, because there are other games that people churn through that you don't see around like you see Pandemic. Mm. Well, they're and just I, less popular. I think the less popular is actually just a. I think there, you know, there's some kinds of people who play a game, eventually figure it out enough to where it's not fun anymore. And other than teaching or occasionally, like I'll play Settlers once a couple every few years, they don't play it anymore. But there's some people 
and they're, I think they're a good like quarter or third of board gamers who I don't think they have the capacity to get bored with a game that they like. No. Like they ne- but they never get good at the game. They're like the scrubs in the fighting uh, culture, like fighting game culture. The people who never really get good enough to be good, but never are bad enough to not have fun, and they enjoy playing the game and constantly play it and never improve themselves. There are people who come to play Netrunner every single tournament, right? They just they're at the bottom. They've been playing as long as I have. They keep showing up, they keep playing, they keep buying cards, and He's still at the bottom of the tournament every time. I don't win. I came in second once, but I, you know, I started like middle ish and now I'm sort of higher middle ish and I'm moving up slowly, very slowly. You know, so that's your, you know, it's like I'm yep. getting better at it. There are gods I can't assail. And then <laughs> so, so my other thing is I think there's a pretty high overlap between the kinds of people who like pandemic. And the kinds of people who like all those House on Haunted Hill, Arkham, whatever kinds of games. Obviously. And I think those core people who never get tired of these games or don't play them enough on a regular basis to get to the point where they'd be tired of them are the ones maintaining this core that draws the churn in. They're the guys who are at the gaming club and they're there every week playing Pandemic. So every week, one of the new people who shows up plays Pandemic once with them. Mm Mm-hmm. So speaking of another game, you guys might remember Candy Box. Candy Box 2 is out. Yep, I played Candy Box 2. I only played Candy Box 2 a tiny bit. It had some more uh, game mechanic mechanics in it. A like whole things. lot more. Yeah, there was a lot to do, and it was pretty fun. But then I cheated. Cheating was slightly more difficult to do than in Candy Box yep, 1. Yep, I tried to give myself just an infinite candy, and that worked, but then... Spending that candy didn't actually work because I messed something up. <laughs> but I digress. Candy Box 1, I didn't cheat. I just beat it by waiting a few days and then playing the game. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but there's another form of Candy Box known as all those games on the 3DS that just make you wait for people and then churn those people through nothing games. Yep. Well, the one the one game is not a nothing game. What game is a not a nothing game? The Shmup is not a nothing game. The, all right. That is... Exactly one Planck's hair width above a nothing game. It's a shmup. <laughs> it's, a, it's a legit shmup. It's not terribly legit. It's not fucking Ikaruga. So is there any reason to play that shmup over, say, an emulated copy of Galaga on your phone? Uh, eh. Other than for the candy box purposes. Captain Candy Pants. It's more of a gra- I'd say it's yeah. more of a gradius than a Galaga. I picture Scott saying this from inside of a candy box. It's more of a gradius. Stomach exposed and gorged on candies. <laughs> so there is another candy box game that many of you are not playing, and I played it a whole bunch, so I'd be able to talk about it. Ingress. Oh, not Cookie Clicker? Fuck Cookie Clicker. <laughs> the, the ultimate in candy box. In fact, the guy who made Cookie Clicker specifically said he was inspired by candy box. Uh, I guess it is in the same class. It is Candy Box. So Ingress, I would say, is it by Niantic Labs, which is really Google. It's like through Google. It's a Google I was game. surprised this thing took off because usually when Google makes shit like this, it just bombs. So from what I've read, Google gave them unprecedented latitude to do whatever the fuck when they made this game. Uh. And as a result, they made the game kind of however they wanted to. And they to. let them stick with it even after failing. They just kept trying. So I got into the early, early beta and proceeded to not play the game at all because my old Samsung Nexus S was not fast enough to render the effects and I couldn't fucking play. <laughs> like, if I, if I was in way out in furthest Queens, the game would work, but there's, like, one portal out there. Great. But then it was when I was in Manhattan, portal density is uh, subject to population density, So there's like a hundred portals that I can see at any one time, and my phone just couldn't deal with it. So Mm. I didn't play until I got my new Nexus 4, and then suddenly I could play. So I played, I leveled up. It's Candy Box. Of course. And it's surprisingly popular. It seems to be most popular among college kids, like people who are in college. Yeah, because that's where you have a density of people savvy enough to play the game. Also cities. You can't play this game in the burbs. Well, you can, but then you know it's funny because in the burbs. But if you're if you're a kid in the burbs and you've got an f- Android phone and you're playing this game, okay, so you can make portals at school and portals at your house. So the portal, maybe so the a portal like at the place you get piano lessons. And that's so here's it. the way the game works. If you played it at all, do you have any idea how it works? I don't have an Android phone. All right, 
I have a bunch of invites, too, if any of you guys want them. I just keep getting them, and I never use them, because everyone I know who wants to play the game has an iPhone. So the way the game works is there's an overlay of the world. Magic dust is falling from the sky. Awesome. Landing all over, I Golden wish. Compass style. So you can join either the Resistance, or you can join the Enlightened. I would definitely, just based on the names, Enlightened. Uh, yeah, also Enlightened is green. Oh, definitely enlightened, 100%. So here's the deal. The enlightened believe that, Fuck wow, resistance. powers come out of this dust. Let's use it to transhuman. Uh, yeah, yeah, okay, so I'm still on the enlightened side. The resistance is worried about the powerful ramifications of this space bullshit and wants to fight against it and wall humanity off from this awesome power. So Republicans? Yeah, pretty much. Okay. So you can either play as an awesome green person or a shitbird blue person. Yep. No red? It's not red? There's only two factions. It's green and blue? <laughs> green and blue. Well, fuck blue. So the way it works is there's portals that are out there. There's a separate mechanism where you can submit places and pictures of things to to them, and they slowly, like, new portals appear in places. Mm -hmm. But just you submitting a portal has nothing to do with the gameplay of the portal. Mm -hmm. So if you find a portal, you can deploy resonators around it. Oh, yeah. And when you apply those, then the portal starts building power and building power. And you can hack it and get shit out of it, like guns and stuff. Mm, guns? What? Well, weapons. Okay. Bursters. XMP bursters is what they're called. But they're guns. You use the magic dust falling from the sky to make guns. Well, that's one thing we do. Because we're not the people who are being transhuman. Like, the being transhuman is not what we're worried about. Wouldn't only about. the resistance make guns? We both make guns. We're the people who are trying to use these portals to gather the dust and accelerate humanity toward this transhumaning. Awesome. So what you do is you hack the portals, and then you can link multiple portals together, and the distance you can link is based on the level and power and energy built up in the portal. So if you make a field by enclosing an entire area with links between your color's portals, then that area is in your zone of control. The population of humans under that is now points for your side. Mm. So it's a fairly straightforward game. You're trying to cover the globe in your color and block the other guys. So you might make a you might coordinate with How's people. New York looking? Uh, New York is all over the place. But right now, there's a big, huge fight going on downtown around City Hall, and the entire area around City Hall Park is flipping from green and blue on a daily basis. And like, you're, you're, you're going for it? I'm a, on my way home yesterday, I blew up like eight portals, claimed them for my team, and captured like four or 500,000 human points. All right. And then How's the next the story, day, some, uh, Queens looking. some eighth level asshole. So Queens is kind of a weird battleground right now. There's this huge green area that's very heavily controlled. It looks like there's three or four high level dudes who've just got that shit locked down. Mm. But there's a bunch of blue creeping its way in. So I shoot at it every day on my way to work on the second <laughs> train. Like the seven passes, this one set of portals. So every day I'm like pew, 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 as many shots as I can get in while I pass. Oh, that's it. You're using the guns to shoot at the portals? So you can go to, to get a portal. guns out of the portals to shoot the portals. You get guns and resonators and items out of the portals. You can upgrade portals with different things like turrets and whatever. And if you hack a portal and it's your own team's portal, you get a lot of stuff out of it. Mm. If you hack an enemy portal, a lot of time it just starts attacking you. Mm. And that's pretty much. But the if you're a high level game. dude, you can take the enemy portal down, right? Yeah, and I can. I'm with level the four. There's max level right now is eight. So how can with all this playing, you're still not level eight? Uh, no, because I've only been playing for a few weeks, and also Do some I'm, more candy bugs. I refuse to coordinate with people or power level or anything because the community is fucking intense. <laughs> like people are really into this Get game. Get in on it. So eh. you want to take City Hall? That's, you know, that's the way. So to go. I'm an opportunist. All I do is I watch, and whenever there's trouble, uh, I'm there right. and I help out. Although three separate people have messaged me because they saw my me doing stuff like this. I want to resonators. They're like, "Are you the Geek Knights Rim? Oh my God! I'm such a fan. Hey, <laughs> hey, hey." <laughs> that's part of the reason why I'm not engaging too much in the community. Oh, you get so people see when you do stuff. Like if you go, like if you set up a portal, like you captured it, your name is on it. Uh, basically forever, unless you lose it. Where's the rim portals? Uh, all the rim portals have been destroyed except for one right now. <laughs> but I have resonators with my name on them on tons of portals because mm. I leave, I, I upgrade people's things, I do like the ng work. The game is fun, but it has the problem that all augmented reality games have they're just candy box if you're willing to do more things than the other team and coordinate slightly more you just start winning 
Uh, candy box is not doing more things. It's waiting. Just patience. It's ah, but this one's also patience. You can just you can wait to accumulate enough stuff and then go do a thing when you have enough stuff to where it would be. Oh, ah, okay, okay. But the difference is that imagine if candy box and cookie clicker were combined. So candy box is just going, and you can just play, or you can click to get extra candies. Mm. So it's more like the candy box of the 3DS games, where if you're willing to go through the bullshit, you'll level up way fast and be way powerful. And if you're just uh, willing to do it, all the puzzle pieces. Uh, if you're willing to just do this shit every day, everywhere you go, you'll get powerful really quickly and have a big impact for your side. Mm. So it's fun, but I'm not going to get any more involved in it than I am now. I will play it idly, like I do all other candy box style games. If you care a lot about this game. And you're one of those lifestylers. Like, I see all these pictures of people who got legit tattoos. Yeah. What? What? Because Google's got, there's, there's some contests going on where they're, they're trying to track down, like, the five coolest agents and give them shit. And sometimes you'll get, like, media and missions and stuff out of these portals, like, specific missions you got to get done. I saw the New York team for the Enlightened coordinating this big thing where they had to, they, there's a portal on Governor's Island. Ooh. The ferry's not running there anymore. Right now. Not now, yeah. So, the the Enlightened still hold the portal. It's got, like, one resonator on it. But no one can go there to put anything else on it. So, so a few people have portal keys to it. Like, sometimes you can get a portal key for a portal, and then you can do stuff with that portal remotely. Mm. So, they're trying to coordinate getting a huge link, like, many miles between that particular portal and some other portal way off in Jersey. <laughs> because that'll it'll basically cut the blue territory in half. So there's this big operation going on. <laughs> I don't know. It's moderately fun, but it's Nintendo 3DS candy box in the end. So I got 545 and it's 545. Well, I got 545 and it's 545. Gotta get a whopper and a 40 ride. Yeah, you know you fucking feel me. Confused. Actually, it's more like 652. I'm glad it is not at all. So uh, I would rather it be 545 yeah, right now, but I I'm guess, glad yeah. that I have more than 545. Mm. So you might remember a, a charming little video about the true history of Sodom and Gomorrah. <laughs> I think we made it a thing. Sodom, made, named after. <laughs> Sodom. <laughs> Sodom and Gomorrah, named after an even worse thing. Um, so the real Brad Neely has a YouTube channel, and that is where that is. Uh, the real Brad Neely is still making stuff. And I stumbled upon this video that the song has just been stuck in my head. I have nothing but good things to say about it because it is, it is exactly what it needs to be. This is Queeblo episode one. Mm -hmm. Whopper and a 40. Just watch it. <laughs> Two things that I will not eat or drink. <laughs> Speaking of eating and drinking, some of my favorite people in the world... Have made a return to the internet. Oh no. The internet celebrities. Chia! Yeah. Here they come. They have come back and they have brought us a new series. The, the series is such a good idea. The Food Warriors. What they are doing is they are going to ride the A train. And at every stop on the A train, they are going to find what people are eating. Episode 1, 168th Street. An area I know. I have been there quite a few times. I bike through there a lot in the summer. Yep, and now I know the names of four restaurants that seem good. Let's go there and eat at El Presidente. We should make our own YouTube series following the Food Warriors. And Malacan. And Antica. <laughs> and all of these good restaurants that are up there. And then let us see the next stop on the A train and eat at those locations as well. These guys do everything that I like on the internet. This is like the highlight of my day, nay week. Nay, month. The fact that they are back. They have been away for a while. We're going all the way, all the way back. Bodega. Chia. Yeah. All right. <laughs> You're not good at saying Chia. Because it's, it's, it's not my culture. <laughs> but Black Dynamite. <laughs> Black Dynamite. <laughs> so, in the meta moment, the book club book is... Aiduru by William Gibson. I've already read it, but I'm going to read it again because I, one, liked it, and two, I want to be able to have an intelligent conversation about it. I just finished the Locke Lamora book, the sixth book the that I finished. The third one. While waiting for Scott to finish Stasiland. Uh -huh. And it's okay. Uh -huh. No, we don't need to do a book club book on it. It's okay. I mean, it's not if you're great. a Locke Lamora fan, you probably want to read it. Yeah, it's not great. It is the weakest of his books. Mm -hmm. By far, but it's okay. 
Uh, we got a bunch of videos on the internet. We do. Yep. We're going to be at MAGFest, probably yep. doing a 90-minute version of Bad Games, what we did at PAX. Probably also being on one or two of the Mages panels, renamed from the Gaming Intellectuals, with a lot more people. We will be moderating and or speaking on these panels. And there'll be other people on them, too. So unlike our usual lectures, you'll see us arguing with and being uh, somewhat adversarial toward other people in this industry. <laughs> dum-dums. <laughs> and also non-dum-dums. Yep. You know who you are. That's right. Uh, PAX East is sold out, so yeah, too late. PAX Aus almost sold PAX out. PAX Aus almost sold out. Uh, so I'm going to submit... Get ready for PAX Prime tickets. Watch your Twitter every day. Uh, I'm seriously considering just reserving a hotel room now for PAX Prime outside of the con rate at, at a considerable expense. All you. Because I'm... Well, actually, Seattle's not so bad because the furthest hotel away is like a five-minute walk to PAX. <laughs> Red line. Unlike Boston. Red line. I mean, yeah. Anyway, this stuff's all sold out. We're going to be at all these things. Probably not us, but... Maybe us. <laughs> if Thinking someone else pays it. for it. Uh, there's a Any benefactors out there who want to buy me a plane ticket to Australia, that's all it takes. I will pay for the hotels and other things while I'm there. If you would like a bespoke panel. Yeah. I mean, you know, <laughs> if you buy me a plane ticket, I will do something for you in return that is within my power and is a fair uh, exchange. We have considered seriously at some point launching a Kickstarter for us to... Return to PAX Australia, do the panel, do the video, I don't think do a, a bunch of specific <laughs> shows. I ran it by some Kickstarter people. They said that as long as the deliverable is shows and content and not us just going to PAX, <laughs> then it's fine. But mm -hmm. I don't know if I'll do it because it's a pain in the ass to pull out together. I might go without Scott. We'll see. We'll play it by ear. So if you I'll go, if I don't go there, I'm going somewhere else. If for sure. you really want to see us at another PAX Australia, either email us and convince us to do a Kickstarter, give us a pile of money, or somehow convince PAX that we're worth flying out. And considering that they didn't fly out, a lot of people who are cooler than us, probably not likely they're going to fly us out. No. But you can always buy them. And the thing is, like, you know, it's like if they fly us out, they're going to fly us right the fuck back. They're not going to, like, let us, you know, pay for us to hang out there a long time. No, no, but the way that works, like when I fly for work, right, because I'm going and I have to come back anyway, they buy my plane tickets. Mm -hmm. But if I want to come back a week later, they still pay for the plane ticket, but I'm on my own when I'm not on their time. Of course. So I'm, I don't think we, I think we're getting ahead of ourselves with the let's get packs to fly us out there. That's plans. never going to happen ever. <laughs> uh, so yeah, also our forum is super upgraded. So if you. And super expensive. If you recently or at some point in the past used to go to our awesome forum and stop, you might want to come back. It's. Uh, it's if you ever like tried to register and failed or anything like that, you quit because there was a feature that you wanted that wasn't there. It's the forum is so much. You better. never joined for some weird reason. Our forum is an ivory tower set unto the withering masses. <laughs> Except mighty. everyone can see what's in the tower. It's totally transparent and not ivory. It's a tr it's the transparent tower, but it is nonetheless a tower. Also, if you had a tower made of ivory, you would totally go to jail. Did you see the government's destroying? That's why I thought of that. That multiple tons of ivory. I still, I'm not sure. Like, why? I don't get it. It's like, how does that make them not want to kill elephants? So if they resell the ivory, you don't want to do that either. So what? Put it all in a museum? Yeah. They already filled. Part of the article said that they have already given all the ivory that every museum and outreach group wants. Oh, okay. Like they don't have any more non-selling uses for it. They've already pulled out all the actual historic artifacts, all the... Does it have any practical uses? Uh, not... You know, someone on FARC said something like, really, someone should work on an ivory substitute. And the second post was, yes, it's called plastic. <laughs> it's true. Yeah. One guy was like, my piano that has ivory sounds and feels so much better. And then the rest of the thread was everyone calling bullshit on that guy. So uh, of course. The rationale I read for them destroying the ivory was that by destroying it, they, one, prove a point. Two, reduce well, the, the supply. The point that they prove is we will catch you. Look how much ivory we caught. 
But That's also, a good point. they reduced the supply of ivory, which, while on one hand, you would argue would increase the cost. That's what you would think, yeah. On the other hand... And increase the demand as well. The less ivory there well, is available... Well, that ivory wasn't on the market anyway. The harder so it, it is... So it effectively was already destroyed in those regards. So if it's there, not gonna the have... less legitimate ivory there is out there that remains, the harder it is for you to explain yourself if you've got some ivory. So it's mm. easier for them to get people who they find with ivory on them. Mm. But who's going to get that ivory? Well, no one now. <laughs> well, I mean, even before it was destroyed, who was going to get it? Well, it, it was in a vault somewhere, right? Vault? Try just unlock government warehouse? I mean... Oh, uh, yeah, that's yeah. not good. Government. It's probably more expensive to put it somewhere safe. <laughs> that's just spending money for nothing. So, when I was a kid, one of my favorite lawn games was bocce ball. I only played bocce like maybe a handful of times. I kind of want to get a bocce set. It's a good game to play. Mm. I like bocce a lot. You don't need a set. If you come up to Astoria and Steinway and there's some courts there, you can just play with the old guys. You just yeah, get actually, balls. one of the apartment buildings that we're looking at to maybe move into in a year or two has a bocce arena on the roof. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Old bocce. people must live there. Bocce ball? I don't know. It's, this, it's the same game as horseshoes, effectively, for sort all of. intents and purposes. Sort of. Same gist. You're trying to get something close to something else, closer yeah. than other people. You know, there are subtle differences. True, uh, in you those can't games. you can't disrupt another person's horseshoe the way that you can disrupt another person's bocce. Well, ball. if they got a leaner, you can mess it up. Uh, I see you're uh, deep in the terminology <laughs> lingo. <laughs> I'm gonna throw. I throw the jack ball so far, you can't even get it out there. Yeah. So one time I was uh, speaking of bocce, right? I have less experience with bocce, but I have experience with something else. Uh, I was going to Whitney Museum, I think, and I heard something happening a few blocks away. So I went to this a few blocks away, and there was this street that was closed off in, Ma in Manhattan. All right. And they were playing this game that looked a lot like bocce, but it wasn't bocce. And I was like, what is this game? And they were, everyone was speaking French. And there was like a French sponsorship, and everything was French. <laughs> and I was like, whoa, is this like the street where French people live? What is going on here? And I couldn't figure out what it was because everyone was speaking in Frenchy. And I was like, what the hell? You couldn't even pick out any cognates? I mean, you know, it's, it's easier for me to do Spanish than Francie. So <laughs> uh, eventually I figured out the game they were playing was Petunk. Petanka? Petunk. Which is very similar to Bocce. And it's actually really interesting. Petunk. Uh, yeah, P-E-T-A-N-Q-U-E. And it's a really interesting game. And here's how it works. You throw out first this sort of uh, object. I guess it's um, a jack of some kind, right? Yeah, it's like the, it's this, it looks like it's the same as the jack ball in Bocce. But it's like a metal thing, I think. Well, right? in Bocce, it, it's just a smaller ball. Yeah, I think in this one, I think it's like a metal ball. Anyway. Small wooden ball, ball called a cochonette. Really? Yeah, yeah, something. Yeah, right. And then you throw out the, basically the bocce balls, and you're just trying to get close to the first one, right? Just like similar to bocce. But here's the way it scores is whoever has the closest ball, gets that ball is, gets points, right? So let's say I have the closest ball and you have the second closest. And then all the other balls don't matter because I, I have the closest one. That's the only one that matters, all right? So I get a point, and you get nothing because mine was closer. Let's say I have three balls that are close, and your ball, your closest ball is the fourth closest, then all three of mine score. So I get three points because your closest was the fourth closest. If my closest is like the fifth closest, then you get four points. Or am I right? Yep, so, there's a nice diagram. Okay, so the big balls are metal. The jack ball is a little lime-looking thing. Oh, yeah, okay. But yeah, it's it's right. So bocce, they're sort of like wooden or stone-ish kind of weird material. They're not well, metal. There is a there is a... Pretty intense standards organization around this game. Yeah. The jack ball they were playing it must seriously. be made of wood or of a specific synthetic material, must carry the maker's mark, and have secured confirmation by the FIPJP. Yep. The tolerance is there is one millimeter for a 30 millimeter ball. Mm hmm Yep. Ooh, glossary of special terms. All I'm right. Tell me, these people are really serious. A lob is not a special term, guys. <laughs> lob is a generic word. Ooh, you can you can get a metrafani. <laughs> to win the game without the opposing team scoring any points is a, is uh to fanny the opponents. Yeah, right? If all of your balls are closer than all of their balls, then you fan <laughs> that's say he made fanny. That's the best possible play. Ela fe fanny. That's like in shuffleboard when all your guys are on scoring points and all their guys are in like the minus. What and must kiss the bottom of a girl named fa What? Wikipedia 
Okay, something about fannies. Anyway, <laughs> I learned about bocce when I was a kid because it was a popular sport among old people who lived in Detroit and the Midwest. And whenever there were garden parties or lawn parties or block parties, the old people would all go play bocce in this one backyard when I was a kid. Yeah. So I would always go over there because I kind of didn't like all the normal little kids in my neighborhood. So I'd go over with those old people and be super polite until they'd eventually let me watch and or play bocce with them. Mm. For us, it, the kids are the people who wanted to play lawn-type games. The adults didn't want to do anything. They wanted to sit around and eat. In the Midwest, the like, lawn games were the thing to do as an adult at a party. Mm. Yeah, adults didn't play lawn games, really, except kids would like try, maybe try to force them. And, of course, our number one lawn game was wiffle ball. Yeah. <laughs> Not forget any of these other things. I mean, you know, there was an occasional badminton, volleyball. We were big up on badminton or basketball. sort of this ghetto soccer or uh, capture the flag. I don't know if capture the flag is really a lawn game. It was for us. Use the whole lawn. <laughs> but you can see everybody. Is it just tackle? Like, how do you do it? Uh, the way we would do it back in the day is you would basically, one half of the lawn in front of the house is one side, and the other half of the lawn in the other half of the house is the other side, right? All right. And you would basically just grab someone. If you could just grab someone and just drag them to the jail, <laughs> then they were in the yeah. jail until someone rescued them, right? Um, and you rescued people in the jail by going in and getting them out. You just had to get to the jail, which was in the enemy territory. <laughs> and then um, the flag would just be fucking hidden somewhere on the other half of the lawn. So you had to get over there. You know, you could sneak over there possibly by doing trickery. Like, you know, you would play in the dark, right? So you sneak, like, into the neighbor's lawns, sneak up, and then hop into the other backyard from where no one saw you hop in. Then you have a few minutes to look around for the flag. Maybe you could run fast, grab it, and get away from everyone. You know, so it's a combination of speed, uh, one person running and making a sacrifice so someone else can make a move, uh, pushing someone down and going past them. You know, all kinds of maneuvers were available. Uh, you know, some woods areas bordering some of the people's houses you could uh, take advantage of. So I guess one thing I'm noticing is that the lawn games that kids tended to enjoy tended to be pretty super serious for the kids involved. Like, mm -hmm. their full focus, and I remember I was the same way, was on the game. Of course. Even if the rules were kind of loose, the kids would focus on the game 100%, and all socialization was based around the game. Mm -hmm. I've seen some adults do that, like the old people playing bocce. 100% focused on the bocce. Is it? Kids and old people and nerds, all of the same mind. And yep. then everyone else, not. Yeah, the ev the everyone else, they, the, it seems like the It's like you go to an old game. you go to an old play old folks place in Florida, right? And it's like I'm playing shuffleboard, kids are playing shuffleboard, grandpa's playing shuffleboard, everyone's trying to win at shuffleboard and what's the conversation? Uh, hit is hit is 10, you can bump him into the minus. You can bump him <laughs> in, they'll go for it. Right or oh no, play it safe. Don't we already got a lot of points? Just don't knock our points out. Just just you know, don't even try to score. Just push it real easy. It's the last. It's the last buck, you know. But everyone else of any other age group or non nerd leaning would just like sit by the pool talking or eating. Well, I think what it comes down to is that the the ideal lawn games are games that can serve both purposes. They can serve the purpose of a serious focused competition, which is easier for kids because kids seem to be able to make. Games that don't have rules somehow very competitive and serious mm. in a way that no one smarter or older will ever be able to do. Well, I think what it is, right, is you look and you know at board games and stuff, and there's the serious games, right, that we play, right, like the ogre that just showed up. Oh my god, like that. that ogre box is so big. Right, but then you have the apples to apples and the cards against humanity and the party games. In basically, lawn games are the party games of sports, right? It's like you're not going to play fucking NFL football. You're going to play croquette. You're not going to play PGA golf, you're gonna, you know, or anything like that. You play badminton. It's like it's a, apples to apples is to, you know, Puerto Rico as, I don't know, horse well, horseshoes like is to... Like, for example, Whatever. King of Tokyo is a simple example. You can mm. play that game super serious and have the social interaction center around the game while you're playing it. Sure. But you can also play it casually where you're putting most of your attention into the game, but you're socializing in equal parts. Mm -hmm. And I think the, the optimal lawn games are the ones that allow for both. They have some 
reasonable, real ortho game component. There's a real competition there. Well, it's usually some sense. it's usually sport in that it's some sort of actual dexterity skill. Yes, right. Something physical you have to do. But so it is an ortho game sport in some capacity. The closer to like uh, you know jungle speed. And it is serious or difficult enough or requires enough skill to where you can have meaningful social interaction centered solely on the game. Like, you mm. can't have meaningful social interaction around a game of tic-tac-toe, even though tic-tac-toe is an ortho game. Sure. But there's no... How, how many sentences can you say related to a game of tic-tac-toe while you play it with someone? You win. It's tie. It's tie. It's tie. So, as a it's result... Tie. These games are perfect when they are both an ortho game, but two, do not require the full attention of the players such that you can choose to socialize solely in the context of the game, which is good for kids who may not you know, know each other that well or have anything else to talk about, and is good for old people because they, they, they want the game to be the focus. They're tired of talking to all their old friends. They want to just play this game, <laughs> and the game provides the social context. Mm. But they also allow the in-between where you're kind of half socializing about the game, but using that as a centerpiece or a talking piece for the rest of your social interaction. Yeah. Also, the thing about them is that while it is possible to have a high level of skill, right, at games uh, of this nature, right, like you can be Olympic badminton gold medal, oh my God, right? But badminton's not like tennis where if you suck, you can't do anything. Like, yeah, you can hit it. It's kind of slow-ish, especially when the other people hitting it aren't Olympic badminton people. So it's it's like a sport that's accessible. Anyone can actually play this and have a meaningful contribution. Horseshoes, it's like, yeah, you if you a professional horseshoe person is getting a ringer every fucking time almost. Just like a bowler get you know, a professional bowler gets mostly strikes and spares with a few nines and eights and not really anything less than that. Uh but you know, if you throw horseshoes and you've never done it before You'll score some points. You're not gonna get zero. You're gonna get something. I feel like really a, bad. A newborn the, baby. I feel really bad for the guy listening to the show who's never scored a point in horseshoes. <laughs> it's like, yeah, listen. You stand there and throw enough horseshoes. You're Measure gonna, is unceasing. You're dude. gonna hit it. It's gonna happen, <laughs> right? You know what I noticed? It's really popular lately, even though I never played it. The game where you have the slanted wooden board with a hole in it, and you throw bean bags trying to get it in the hole. Oh, uh, cornhole. I don't know. I guess that what it's called. Uh, that's I see what a I've lot of people. I see bringing that to the beach. I've seen people playing that in football uh, stadium parking lots while tailgating. I see that game everywhere, and it's like, oh yeah, it's something everyone can play. It's got a skill to it, right? You know, and it's it's actually can actually be pretty intense because you throw that thing and it's like slides up the board after it hits. So it has a little bit of that golf action where it's like, oh, 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 oh. No. Yep, that's cornhole. Okay, yeah, cornhole. It's that is the popularity of that has been increasing. I wonder. For a few I there's years. no way that did not become popular on its own. Either it was in some TV show that's popular, or someone like made a version of it, like a Hasbro, and then marketed it. I don't know. It's, there's it's, no way it became. It popular. has become popular. Maybe recently. it has some hipster kish. I have been seeing some hipster it, cachet. Uh, it's not hipsters. I see playing it. I see normal people doing it. But it's I see more and more of that game every year in various places. I did not expect to see it. Uh, it used to be like a thing that you would see in like summer camp, maybe, and that was about it. And now I'm seeing it in all sorts of other places. So it's not too bad. You know, I, I remember we were at Scott Johnson, our friend, had a huge party at his new house. Mm -hmm. And he did lawn games, are, they, they're such a good idea for large gatherings of people who might not all know each other because he left this badminton set just set up in the backyard. Mm -hmm. And people were rotating in and out and basically playing badminton for the entire day, like 14 hours at any given time, at least two or four people were playing badminton constantly. Mm -hmm. And it sort of, it focused people who weren't immediately interacting socially on a, on an ortho game and gave them a context for their further interactions and caused like the conversation pieces to shuffle in and out. And it caused, it was like a stirring rod inside of the party. <laughs> As, and, the, and I say that because the people, there was a set of people who it was hot, so they stayed inside. There was one part of the house that was air conditioned, and a chunk of people were in that place and never left it. And every time I peek my head in there with the same people, and the conversation was, shall we say, stagnant. <laughs> mm. 
This has been Geek Nights with Rim and Scott. Special thanks to DJ Pretzel for the opening music, Cat Lee for web design, and Brando K for the logos. Be sure to visit our website at frontrowcrew.com for show notes, discussion, news, and more. Remember, Geek Nights is not one, but four different shows. SciTech Mondays, Gaming Tuesdays, Anime Comic Wednesdays, and Indiscriminate Thursdays. Geek Nights is distributed under a Creative Commons Attribution 3.0 license. Geek Nights is recorded live with no studio and no audience. But unlike those other late shows, it's actually recorded at night. There's a party at this girl's house I think we're cool because with stamps I always help her out She is fine but her friends are kind of this and thatness But with me I better help her find her inner catness So I dance with my manager Vance Asking if I could just get a friendly payment advance He blows me off so I scoff Throw my smock, check the clock, take it off Check my wad, feeling soft All I got is 5.45 and it's 5.45 Gotta get a whopper and a 40 I got 5.45 and it's 5.45